Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson at the Canadian Investor Conference Vancouver. And I am joined by Chief Energy Strategist of KC Research, Marin Katuza. Nice to see you again, Marin. My Marin. pleasure. Let's start off talking about that big blockbuster gas deal between China and Russia, said to be worth about $400 billion. What is the impact of that going to be on the world gas market? It is the largest deal to date, and especially what's going on in Europe right now. There is the colder war going on. So the day before the elections were going to happen with the Ukraine, Vladimir Putin flies into China. This has been going on for over a decade, the negotiations mm -hmm. back and forth. And why it's really important, and this is 1.3 TCFs of gas. That's somewhere probably around $10 billion a year starting. And they're building that main pipeline. Then they're mm -hmm. going to twin it, which is going to get to over 2.5 TCFs of gas. Then they're going to build all of the capillary pipelines to go to other areas within Asia. So you're going to see the Koreans announce a deal and all the other countries in Asia. So this, put it this way, it makes up 25% of China's consumption today, just as it is. And you know that China is going to be growing for their consumption. And this now puts Europe at huge risk because a country like Germany used to make up 25% of the revenue of Gazprom. Mm -hmm. Well, not any longer. Europe has competition, Asia, which it didn't have before. Well, does it also put BC's LNG industry, which is very much in its infancy, but does it put this at risk? A lot of people saying, whoa, you know, this is where BC 100%. was going to be shipping its, all its uh, LNG to China as well. I've read an article going that the greatest energy short ever will be the LNG sector, what's going on. First of all, BC is five years behind Australia. And if you look at the cost overruns of Australia, it's been a disaster, okay? The, the cost to ship it from BC is much more expensive than from Australia. And not only is this just a conventional gas deal, the Russians are also doing LNG. But so wouldn't China then or any other countries in Asia looking look for more of a stable provider? I mean, Russia's not seen to be the most stable provider. Out Actually, there. Russia is a very stable provider. Europe has been increasing their energy imports from Russia every year for the last two decades. And stable despite what's going on between Russia and Even, Ukraine? And that Ukraine's just in the middle between, there's a new alliance being formed. And the day that this energy deal was signed, the president of China said, and I quote, China must rethink its strategy for security. This includes a new union, including Russia and Iran, and not including the US and the EU. There's going to be a new United Nations without the American and European influence. The boundaries have relined. There's a new access form, and the U.S. and Europe is out. So what do you think that means for British Columbia as it's trying to get up to speed and get LNG off its feet? Well, it would be nice if the politicians actually had some spine and they actually got their act together and we start developing a plan. Are you we talking about the tax regime? The tax regime is a perfect start. What about the permitting process? What about actually making these decisions? Because, yes, it's great for a politician to give some political lip service, but these things take 10 years to develop and the investors need to know what their risks are moving forward. So let's assume that the government's going to announce its tax regime tax regime by the end of November, which it says it's going to do, then it's up to the companies to decide if they're viable operations and whether they're going to go ahead. Do you think there's room for British Columbia to become a major player? Um, I wouldn't say a major player, but yes, there's room to be a player because remember, the new allies within Asia, when you look at China, Iran, what's going on then with Russia, Japan is now left out. It's part of the old guard. They're still aligned with the Americans, so the Japanese definitely need to import. And if you look historically, Japan has been a big importer of BC copper and BC coal. Mm -hmm. It's the Pacific Rim advantage. So BC has to work closer with Japan and they're a great country to work with. So then when you look at all of this that has developed very quickly just in the last several weeks, what do you think this means for the energy markets then? It's fantastic as an investor. In our book, The Colder War, we talk about the European energy renaissance and how you can make a fortune from this. And Europe, if the EU 28 is to survive, they have to decrease their electricity costs. They have the most expensive electricity in the world. There's no way a country like Germany, which is the Euro uh, European manufacturing hub, can pay three times electricity costs and expect mm -hmm. to compete with the Americans. So Europe was producing oil before Texas was. They got to bring modern technology to these past producing oil fields. That's what they have to do. It's starting. And as an investor, you can make a lot of money from this. And what about looking at the U.S. markets? Because you say it's uh, the energy industry there is pretty played, but you do see some potential in the service sector. So talk to me a little bit about that. Like what kind of companies are you looking at and where are you seeing the potential? We've had a fantastic run with companies like NOV, Schlumberger, Halliburton. 
where these are majors and they've doubled. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a little junior with a 10 million market cap going to 25. We're talking about a company with a $50 billion market cap going to over 100. So someone like Schlumberger, the world's largest energy service company, has had a magnificent uh, bull market. And because they're paying a yield, investors have to put their money somewhere and they're overpaying, so there's a lot of risks in the market too. So I want to warn investors, make sure you put your stop losses because things are pretty frothy in the U.S. market right now. And you know, I would be remiss if we didn't actually talk about Keystone in the U.S. Uh, where are you seeing that? I mean, there has been no indication from the U.S. government that it wants to make a decision quickly on this. Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. When you, when you talk about the energy sector, you got to look at from the leadership down. Mm -hmm. And Obama has been outplayed by Putin in every form, from Syria to Europe and the Ukraine, now with the Chinese deal. And Putin, or, um, Obama is not going to do what's right for his people. He's going to do what's right for his administration. So it's going to be delayed. Like I've been saying for the last three years, it's going to cost more money. Now they're talking about building a bridge to ship rail via oil because it's taking too long. So that's actually worse for the environment. There's more risks to that. Well, I was going to say shipping uh, anything by rail, I think, is, comes with a lot of risk. I mean, all we need to do is look what happened in Lake Megantique. And so that would probably cause more public concern. Well, ironically, because of the, the NGO activity fighting against this pipeline, rather than doing it properly in what I call a sensible solution to this problem, we're depending on old pipeline infrastructure built before 1960. That's what's at risk. The huge increase of shipping oil via rail, that's the huge risk. Mm -hmm. Building a new modern pipeline is less risky than depending on the old pipelines and the rail. So, Okay, new modern pipeline, got to ask you then, what do you see happening with Northern Gateway? I think they're all going to happen. It, again, but it's going to it, take more time. A longer timeline. Longer timeline, and investors are going to be exposed to more risks, higher costs. So uh, let's dig into this a little bit on Northern Gateway because there has been obviously a lot of opposition from First Nations groups, from communities as well. You think that the Harper government will still approve this despite that opposition? Six months ago here I said with you yes, I know. that Prosperity would not get its permit because it was not the worth the risk for Pre uh, Prime Minister Harper. He's an Alberta boy, this pipeline's important, and you'll see in 20 years we're going to have pipelines to the west, we're going to have pipelines to the east, and a pipeline to the south. It's what makes sense for Canada as a country, and we need to do it. We're going to do it properly, but it will get done. Can you give investors any kind of idea, um, given how closely you watch this sector, about what the timeline looks like? I mean, I know that you don't have a crystal ball and you're not working uh, for Mr. Harper, but what do you think that a reasonable timeline would be on this? I think, uh, Prime Minister Harper is actually doing the right things. He's told the President Obama that it's not appropriate and professional what he's been doing. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be outside of Harper's uh, time frame as Prime Minister. And I think within five years, all of the actual permits will be settled. And then it'll take a few years to build these. So within 10 years, we'll have the pipelines the way well, we should What have needs them. to happen to get both of these projects done? Is it more community consultation, more consultation with First Nations groups? What is it? Because right now they don't have the social license to go ahead. Exactly. It starts from the grassroots, more education. There's a lot of misinformation. It's almost like a religious proposition to a lot of people where they just believe and they don't want to listen to anything else. So it, you first start with education. That's a very difficult process. It's very timely. And, and I'm not saying that Enbridge has been perfect in this. There's a lot of education on both sides that has to happen, but it has to start with the leadership, with the politicians to move forward. And unfortunately, you know, politicians are politicians. So hopefully we can move this forward. But in my opinion, it's going to take a lot longer than we expect and longer than we want, but it's going to also cost more money. Always. Thanks very much, Marin. Good to talk to you. My pleasure.